It's that time again. The annual conference of the American Society of Ag Consultants, otherwise known as ASAC, is going to be held in Fort Myers, Florida, this November 4th and 5th. Kirk Covington is one of nine professionals who will address the conference. The other speakers who will cover a wide range of topics represent Florida Farm Bureau, Florida Citrus Commission, University of Tennessee Institute of Agriculture, National Ag Law Center, Risk Mitigators and Advisors, Tyler Associates, as well as the lead economist for dairy at Cobank, and myself, Chrissy Wozniak, from North American Ag. The day and a half of presentations will be followed by ag tours on Tuesday afternoon at Echo Farms, one of my favorite places here in Fort Myers. Attendees will experience farming at its most creative, with unique demonstrations, plants, and techniques being used to help farmers and urban gardeners in developing countries. A second tour at ECHO will showcase simple technologies that can improve food, water, and shelter for millions of people. A third tour of a hydroponic grower is also being planned. For more information and to register, visit www.agconsultants.org. That's www.agconsultants.org. See you there. Our sponsor today is Morning Egg Clips. Morning Egg Clips is America's number one daily ag news service, designed to be a quick and easy read. It will help you stay up to date on the important headlines in both local and national agriculture every business morning. You can go to their website at www.morningagclips.com to sign up or peruse the headlines. Connect with them on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Your Morning Egg Clips will help to keep you in the know. Welcome to the North American Egg Spotlight. I'm Chrissy Bozniak. Today I get to speak with a dear friend in the industry. Not only is he one of the kindest humans I've ever met, but his passion for regenerative agriculture is totally inspiring. Raised on a dairy farm in southwestern Ontario, the love of egg is in his blood. Now he serves as CEO of Gaps Ontario. I would like to welcome Gary Walker. Welcome, Gary, and thank you so much for being here. Boy, thanks for that, uh, Andrew. <laughs> promo for me i mean i didn't realize uh, now, now i gotta get another hat thank you for everyone for listening to what my passion is uh, it took me uh five years away from my my original business to get involved in this and it grows from a passion of uh, my grandson being the sixth generation on this farm um, i do know i no longer farm but my, we rent the land out and my son and, and his family live right next door here with us. And I know that my grandparents, my father and myself have done a lot of, gee, a lot of harm to possibly the environment. And my dad and my grandfather have passed and I guess the torch is on to me to try and do something to rectify what we've done um, for my grandchildren. And, and I must also say rectify it, but we, we done some things that we didn't know any better. We didn't have the education as to what we were doing. But now that we do have the education, I believe it's, uh, it's what we need to do. Yeah, that's pretty honorable. And so what, is, what does GAPS actually stand for? Stands for GA Phosphorus Solutions. Um, <laughs> when I when I got the name figured out, my wife wondered if I was selling clothing. <laughs> yes. Uh, not such. Uh, my name is Gary Allen Walker, and uh, so that, that's the GA. And the phosphorus came into light when I was a general manager for another company that uh, done erosion control. And so um, at that point, we decided to separate and I started my own business and they are still in business. And um, I operate really closely with a project called the PRC project. And, and that project, um, what excited me because it included farmers, mm -hmm. it included city people, governments at three or four levels, well, however many levels you can find in the government, they all wanted to be involved with it. And to me, this phosphorus solution 
is something that is all of our problem and that we all need to find a solution. So they were the group I wanted to work with. Right. And so why is phosphorus such an important issue for farmers and for the world, really? So I just recently picked up a, a July 13th uh, issue of Farmers, uh, Today's Farmers. And, and the headline there is Beneath the Blooming Nuisance of Lake Erie's Algae. Right. Um, we, we have no idea as farmers and keepers of the soil um, I, and some of us do. Don't I shouldn't I shouldn't paint everyone with the same brush. Mm -hmm. there, there's there's a lot of misunderstandings out there, and and we have we as farm community have a huge effect on what Lake Erie is, and we're not all the people that affect it, but we have three to four rain events a year that uh, cause a great effect. Um, a third of Lake Erie's water comes from our basin and around 2.6 6 million people feed into that. So we are the breadbasket and we do feed into that. So to me, uh, phosphor phosphorus is something that will run out in time mm -hmm. and, and we need to use it properly. It's needed and um, Algae really likes it. So if we can keep it on our farmland and not send it to the lake, then algae will miss be missing one of the three ingredients it needs. And that's heat, sunshine, and food. And the nutrients, if we can keep them on our land, then we're not going to hurt the lake as bad. Right. Well, I live about a mile and a half from Lake Erie. And I can tell you that those algae blooms are bad. You do not want to be on the beach. It smells bad and the fish die. There's fish all over the beaches during a bloom. And yeah, so, so it, it is a big issue, isn't it? And, and that was the thrust of this uh, issue. They were talking about the fishing industry and what it's doing to them. And it, and it is having a huge effect. There are dead zones in Lake Erie. Yeah. And we didn't have that when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. So what have we done? So can you explain what the different methods are that you use to remove phosphorus on the farm? So, as I said before, three to four uh, rain events in a year are the major contributors and it is runoff. So uh, we put phosphorus along with different nutrients on our soil to make it make the plants grow better. If the timing is wrong, um, and that is manure spreading also, you know, there's a, there's phosphorus in manure and then in the nitrates in it, it will run off. And so, um, I'm involved in five different projects and the one that has come to the top is a project that we run with open drainage systems in agriculture. So there's two kinds of drainage, open and closed. And the open ones um, will catch that surge of runoff. And that's where the loading happens. The largest loading happens. And so uh, we have open catch basin closures that will, will treat the water as it goes through. And uh, hick and bottoms, uh, we treat the water before it goes through there. And, and one of the very important things is the flow rate, because as a farmer, I put tile in my farmland to drain it off so as I can get on it better so it doesn't kill the plants. So mm -hmm. flow rate is really important. So we flow that through different uh, kinds of material to, to make a, to basically make a filter for uh, phosphorus. And we, we have collected a lot of data behind all five projects and, and that one in particular um, works the best at this point. Right. And what other ways do you do you use as well? So we have a site at the Chippewa, the First Nations. We work closely with the uh, folks down there and that's right on the Thames. And, and the water is very important to them as it should be to all of us. We have a farmer down there that uh, understands why and he's the 
he rents the land from the land trust uh, with the, uh, from the reserve. Um, uh, the native people have been really good with us to allow us in there and work on it. That particular system, we are able to, we buried at a 12,000 gallon tank and we we're able to load that tank with different kinds of material. Mm -hmm. And we're able to direct the flow from a closed drain system into that tank at whatever, level, whatever levels we require. Wow. Uh, we're working closely with uh, OMAFRA with some of the, um, you know, a lot of the data that we can record, we have to have a way to, to do that. And, and OMAFRA has allowed us that way. Mm -hmm. um, some of the products we've used in there is, uh, we've used a smart sponge, they call it, uh, it's a iron impregnated wood. We've used a nanotechnology uh, coming out of the States that done a job, but it's quite expensive. We've used biochar in there. Um, at this point right now, we have zeolite in there. And so this whole system is set up such that um, at any time we can remove, clean it out and put in new product. Mm. And we've spent uh, well, over two years now collecting data on different products. Um, the next one we're heading to, uh, I believe will be a product, uh, uh, well, they're using it right now in another um, setup that I'm looking, working, not looking after it totally, but along with the lower Thames and myself, we, uh, we look after that and it's down near Chatham. And that particular product that's in there right now is uh, out of the University of Windsor. And it's a manufactured product that um, that the results aren't in on yet. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are three. I'm also involved, I do the site work and, and all the coordination of uh, a site on the Medway Creek, Medway River, whoever, you, some people call it Creek, some people call it River, but it's right beside the University of Western Ontario. And we work with a, a guy from out uh, in BC called Muddy River. Mm -hmm. They have a different way of uh, the electrically charge uh, rods of um, magnesium. And in that way, um, without getting into all the details, which I'm not always sure of anyway, because my, my background is not necessarily in the chemical end of it. Mm -hmm. um, but so we, we uh, send that through a sea can that holds all the equipment. Oh, wow. Just recently, yeah, just recently that, that particular project is um, in the throes of getting handed over to the University of Western Ontario. Mm -hmm. And we work closely with the environment people there, uh, Martha at Dagnew. And uh, there's a young man who's doing his master's, and that's his thesis, his uh, wow. phosphorus rule. So um, it, it, see, it, see, there's, there's certainly a, a lot of projects out there that are underway. Um, another one that I'm, I'm not as closely connected to is a is a project around Granton. That's a small town north of London. And then there's another, another uh, situation uh, that would be east of London, east and kind of south. Um, and they use canisters with iron slag in it to same sort of filtration as my tank. Wow. Um, yeah. That's really cool. So uh, a, lo a lot of, uh, there's a lot of projects going on <laughs> in my life. Yes, I guess. Yeah, and you mentioned biochar. Um, I've heard a lot about that in the last few years. So, um, first of all, how is that made? What is biochar? So, biochar, I import it. To, first of all, I searched around to find the best biochar. Biochar is not something that's created equal, as you and I are not created equal. Um, when bio, good biochar is made, it's made through a process of pyrolysis, and that's 
really high heat and low oxygen. So it's, mm. it's basically cooked. And that, if you look at it in a microscope, has a whole bunch, it has a honeycomb effect of chambers. And those chambers will, are like a, like a water tank for the soil. So they will hold soil and nutrients. Um, so just with that short version theory, if we've got chambers in there that will attract phosphorus, then we can put it in the water, put it in the soil, and it'll attract the phosphorus. That's it also attracts other nutrients because um, I have an ongoing, um, uh, it's more than a project now, they're using my product um, up near Walkerton, uh, the, the land of the, the water problems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, it's Lake Rosalind, and they are in the third year of using the product to, um, to make their water, their lake accessible to their over 200, 250 people that live around this small lake. Mm -hmm. They drink and they play in the water. So that's, that's as important to them as the water is on the Chippewa. Um, so I guess that's the biochar. So I, I can go on and on about biochar, but you know, that that's the water remediation or this, uh, the water end of it. And uh, yeah, the water remediation. And then I can go on to the soil amendment. So, mm -hmm if you put it in soil and i mean it's been it's been done for thousands of years down in south america and it's getting some traction right now um with organic people uh, especially mm. um, the soil amendment allows of course those little holding tanks for water um and it also holds nutrients in there so you know the first year that this uh, biochar is put in your soil it won't necessarily show up in huge positive but as soon as the soil gets the right percentage which is around oh i suggest to golf courses that they run about three to four percent volume so that's per volume so talking about the top three inches of the soil um yeah so that's that's kind of the two ways we use the biochar right that's Go ahead, yeah. yes. I've heard that um, it can also be used as a feed additive for cattle. Is that true? Yeah. So um, speaking with a local feedlot, uh, another young person, and I and I love it when I speak with young people because that means that there is life in this whole system, mm -hmm. that we're going to fix it. Uh, the, the young lady, uh, her, her thesis was feeding a feedlot of cattle with biochar mixed into it and to make it tastier they put some molasses on it and you know that tasted better so it, it went through their digestive system mm -hmm. and in turn um assisted in odor suppression suppression mm -hmm. and that's interesting and in the same situation now it's gone through the animal and it's going to the soil. So, you know, it's already activated as it gets to the, to the field, activated through the digestive system and, and oh. manure. So it was a, and, and that was a, so there's, there's a ton of stuff going on uh, with biochar. It's a, you know, it's one of those old things that are being revived and quite a product, I think. Um, yeah. And you, you said you work a lot with golf courses as well. So what kind of solutions do you have for them? We haven't worked with the soil remediation uh, amendments at this point. It's all water remediation. So okay. um, I sell to the Ontario Seed Company. And those people are known to sell the little packets of seed that you pick up in the store and grow in your garden. Mm -hmm. uh, they also sell a ton of fertilizer and everything else under the sun and the guy gentleman i deal with uh, he uh he sells to about 700 golf province of ontario and this year he tripled his order for their ponds so they we put them in a bag uh we kill them a, a biochar sack uh we sink them down to you know six inches below the top of water 
And again, that becomes a holding tank for the bad stuff that we want to get out of there. And golf courses are notorious for wanting their water to look clean Mm -hmm. and their greens to look green. So the greener they look, the more stuff they put on uh, and the more I have to take out of the pond. So it seems to be working quite well so far. Yeah. So it's similar to putting charcoal in your pond then? Yeah. I, and, and you got to be really careful about saying charcoal, Uh, you know, biochar and charcoal are way, way kind of (laughs) like, a blonde and a white hair, (laughs) Uh, (laughs) quite different. Um, We, we related as charcoal to the individuals who don't quite understand it to kind of introduce um, what it really is. So uh, it, you know, I I think relating it to the average household, it'd be like the filter system that they put in a fish tank. Okay. Yeah. That's the kind of stuff they put in a fish tank. And you know what it does, or put a fish tank, and you could throw it, throw it in your fish pond too, Chrissy. I know, yeah, that it, that's what I'm thinking. This sounds great for my pond. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't hurt it at all. And yeah. uh, and you know the lifespan of biochar is thousands of years. Mm-hmm. So you know once you put it there, um, I guess if you're putting it in ponds that are continually fed with the wrong stuff. Mm-hmm. then you do have to remove your sack. So that's why we put in a sack so we can rejuvenate that. But yeah. then again, you know, and, and that in itself is, is a good thing because once I remove it from a project, I can take it out and spread it on my field. Right. It does absolutely no harm. In wow. fact, now it's activated when I spread it on my farm. Mm-hmm. And, and I must say too, that, that I, my company, I refuse to deal with chemicals. Mm-hmm. So anything I deal with is non-chemical and uh, environmentally sound and friendly. I guess I could call it green, but biochar is black. (laughs) (laughs) So what do you recommend that producers do to help minimize the phosphorus runoff that's contributing to the problem? So I work very closely with a gentleman called Charlie Lalonde. Mm -hmm. Charlie... Um, great person oh it's just a wealth of knowledge I mean that man he's got more knowledge in his little finger than most people have in their whole body in a lifetime I believe it. his contacts are just awesome because he was in the middle to upper management with Omafra for 30 some years wow he now has a five-year-old consulting firm and that's his passion and and honestly, you know, we both come from a farm background. I come from a dairy farm. Um, he comes, uh, he's originally up from up in Quebec, a large farm, large family. And our passions are so similar. We want to make this place a better place for our grandchildren. And mm-hmm. so we're in the process right now. I'm putting together uh, um, a fact sheet, the price list, uh, and upscaling one of the projects. Mm-hmm. And he's uh, searching out grants. Uh, he's he's very adept at that. He has contacts all over the place. So, you know, coming up, um, I believe that we will be coming out with a tried, proven, and a data-backed uh, system to look after runoff. Awesome. And would it be on-farm or? On-farm only. Yep. I, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's... Uh, most of my focus is on farm um, mm-hmm. because again, you know, in the past, um, the more educated people have kind of pointed fingers at agriculture mm-hmm. as a, as a real bad actor in sending bad stuff down to the lake. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, they're not totally wrong. Farmers need to get, things together um but farmers aren't the only ones that have an influence on what's happening in our lake and uh that's one of the reasons we do all these r&d projects is to prove either way right or wrong Mm -hmm. you know yeah and uh, being backed by actual data is is the best way to go right and and because you're involved in all of these 
research product projects. And uh, I know you have a few of the results on your website, I believe, or videos. Yeah, the they're mostly on the PRC website. So okay. if, mm -hmm. if you want to look for all these results, because honestly, I'm the guy that, that, that does all the leg, or not all, but does leg work on R&D. Mm -hmm. When I find an R uh, development that works, I put it in my toolbox and I take it out to the end users. Mm -hmm. So the data is backed by labs and so on and so forth, not yours truly, a third party. Because right. when I deal with you as a customer, um, to tell you everything I've done doesn't always work in my mind. It has to be yeah. third party. Absolutely, yeah. One of the most recent things that I've run across is the is a couple of young lads, two graduates from uh, the uh, Ivy School of Business. So they've graduated. They've got some business uh, wishes. Uh, one of them actually ended up on Shark Tank with one of his businesses and, and apparently done well. I haven't got into it too deeply, but they've approached me about the biochar to put it into soil. So I'm, I'm not the guy that is going to go out and knock on the farmer's door and say, here's, here's a, you know, a square meter of biochar, spread it on your farm and it, and it will cost you. I'm just looking at benefits. And so these gentlemen, I am just in the middle of collaborating with these young men that I believe will, uh, attempt to change the world <laughs> and mm -hmm. that's that's always the good thing about youth i don't have enough time left to change the world but they might so aligning with those gentlemen um so soil amendment like soil amendment is is where they want to go mm -hmm. and that's great for me because soil amendment is something that i have only dabbled with the water remediation is more where i'm at and the mm -hmm. soil amendment is really important because of the organic farmers in our community. Mm -hmm. um, and these lads, they want to give the farmers a reason why they should use whatever they recommend because their bank account will grow. And if there's anything I've learned from farming, um, if it doesn't have a rate of return, I'm sorry, go sell it to my neighbor because I'm too busy trying to meet my expenses. Okay. And yeah, uh, I was talking to them um, last week and I will have them on a future show. You're right. They're so inspiring. And uh, and yeah, what they want to do is collect the organics from the city of London, I believe. Yes. And then um, mix it with biochar and then do soil testing and find farmers that this particular mix would help. So I, I think that's a really cool idea. I can't wait to talk to them on the show about that. Carbon credits. Thank mm -hmm. you, Chrissy. Yes. <laughs> carbon credits. So carbon yeah. credits are an up and come, coming, wonderful, wild, unregulated, who knows? And, you know, but to be prepared for it, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's like in a barn full of cattle. If you leave the gate out and they get out. And you got to go chase them. But if you keep the gate closed, you're prepared for mm -hmm. uh, keeping them fed and, and keeping them there. So I, I believe that they're closing the gate on some of these uh, situations. And, and they'll, I'm looking forward to, uh, they've brought me on as a, as a consultant. And, you know, before you, uh, you know, get, my, my mind didn't go, in the right way when I hear about a couple of Ivy school grads and, you know, both from the city and they want to make farming better and, and all that sort of thing. So, you know, it's, it's one of those, uh, yeah, sure. Okay. And I have a cousin that we talked about it and he was kind of, yeah, sure. I'm going to show this. So they've hired me to talk with these farm people on their level um, and not, not up or down, but sideways level, their level of, of what they need and what they want to hear from these chaps. So they're, they're willing to um, learn, really learning. 
And uh, so that's what I'm going to help them do with the farm community. Um, there was an article in National Geographic last October, uh, and writer Julia Rosen stated nearly all of the phosphorus that farmers use today and that we consume in the food we eat is mined from a few sources of phosphate rock, mainly in the United States, China, and Morocco. By some estimates, those could run out in as little as 50 to 100 years. So my question is, how can farmers reduce their use of phosphorus now and ease their dependence on it for the future when this does eventually run out? So right now we're doing another test project at the Chippewa site. Um, and this project is feeding the plants uh, with a product that will help them uptake the phosphorus and make better use. Okay. We only use about 40% of the phosphorus when we put it out in the land. You know, we lose it. Um, we, we've got to learn how to use it properly or that 50 to 100 years could be less. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, this product, uh, we're just in the te data testing stages and it's on a wheat field right now. So it's sprayed on, it's a really easy product to put there and, and I'll, I'll put a kick out for my friend, Tom. It, the name of the company is Penergetic. And these are the people that, that I want to be involved with because they have the same focus that I have. Mm -hmm. uh, Another set of really great people. Yes. Uh, so um, when this Penergetic is used, mm -hmm. the uh, root system spreads out further. And when it spreads out further, they can get better use of whatever's in the soil. It also promotes the microbial soil um, sample. So if you were to look at a field, we look at a field of corn. I glance out my window and it's looking really good in my area right now. Mm -hmm. All we see is that corn growing or not. We don't realize that that half of our uh, available growth is the soil, and there's a whole life cycle underneath in that soil. So if we treat that soil properly, let the microbes grow, let the roots grow, um, we'll end up with a better yield in our crops. I really don't want companies like CIL and the big chemical companies to get bent out of shape, but it reduces the use of chemicals right. in their fertilizers. So um, it's going, we know it's a hard, hard push, uh, but the organic type of push is getting a lot larger. And uh, just in my time on the farm here, I mean, we kind of done the organic thing when we would do summer fallow. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't afford to do that anymore. You got to get the crop in out and, you know, do whatever you got to do with it. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of like it to this Penergetic allowing you to do that again. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's some other, some other uh, situations where I've researched and talked to other companies uh, back to the biochar. There is a company out West um, that they have incorporated about four to five percent biochar in their animal waste. They got a, a feedlot of twenty thousand. In layman's term, that's a lot of poop to get rid of. Mm -hmm. So what they do is uh, they dry it, they heat it, they use the heat that comes from it, they palletize it, and they use the energy in their feedlot from that whole system, and they put biochar with it. Uh, I've got samples of this organic fertilizer that can be spread with any commercial application app applicator wow. of any other fertilizer. So this stuff, it's, it's seamless. You know, you can put a bag of fertilizer in one end of the spreader and a bag of this stuff in the other and mm -hmm. the fertilizer spreader doesn't choke on it. Wow. And so, and it's dried down too. So. Well, that's really cool. Um, yeah, there's a, and that, that company is called Earth Renew. Mm -hmm. uh, they need a, they need a kick too. And, and by the way, I, I, I like to promote the people I deal with. The biochar that I deal with is in Colorado. Uh, James has uh, worked closely with me and he's uh, got 
uh, Biochar Now is the company's name. Mm -hmm. And anything that comes to Ontario through him uh, has been directed towards me. Mm -hmm. We also, um, we're hearing news that as soon as this uh, pandemic gets kind of straightened around that they may be producing it right here in Mississauga. So oh, nice. you know, that will really, really make it a lot easier, a lot more affordable because of the lack of transportation and lack of uh, money exchange. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, the, there's a lot, there are a lot of things on the, on the horizon that they're, the sun's shining, start to shine. <laughs> yes, that's good. So yeah, speaking of the pandemic, changing lanes a little bit, how has the pandemic affected your business? It, uh, like everything else, it's kind of changed it, but I'm, I'm not the guy that looks at the dark cloud. I look at the silver lining in it. Mm -hmm. um, this last while, it slowed my projects down. Um, fortunate enough to be on the downside of all the grant money. So it was just wrapping a lot of stuff up. The uh, Chippewa site were allowing me on their property to deal with whatever I had to deal with. Um, you know, it, it's really allowed me a lot of reading time and, and education from my point of view. Um, I don't really hit the streets that much at this point in time. Um, I think the education value and, and just what we're doing right today, and I, I really hope there's a farmer or two out here that uh, is listening to this and, and scratches their head and goes, hey, I should give that guy a call. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can find me on a website and and uh, I guess uh, you'll probably post it on your podcast somewhere along the line and that's and, right uh, yeah and put on my connections on there them. yeah so uh you know any anyone who who wants to challenge anything i've said or mm -hmm. wants to be curious about what i've said my ears are wide open um yeah. i will uh, i will talk to anybody uh, anyone that knows me knows i have one gift at least <laughs> and that is the gab <laughs> Yep, that's for sure. <laughs> you love to talk about this stuff. It's so great. Yeah. And what do you think are some of the best, the greatest opportunities that in agriculture right now, from your point of view? We have an opportunity to fix what we've messed up. The will is there, and I'd, I'd like to take a quote out of this article. We know how the problems can be fixed. We just need the will to change agriculture practices to address, address nutrient loading, Algae is simple creatures. They need sunlight, light, they need carbon dioxide, they need nutrients. So that's our oppor opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think the opportunity is to do better for our soil and our bank account at the same time. Right. It's yeah, a big, it's a big uh, wish, but I think we have that opportunity. That's awesome. So I have one last question for you. Yes. Um, what did God put you on this earth to accomplish and what gets you out of bed in the morning? My grandkids, my family, mm -hmm. um, the love of my neighbor, my friends. Um, that's why I got the shot because I care. Um, so that, that's my passion. Um, I don't need to leave a legacy. I just need to leave a better place for my kids to live. Yep. You can't beat that. Can you? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me today, Gary. It was a pleasure as always to chat with you. Thank you so much. Um, can hardly wait to see you in person again. Yep. Yeah. And get one of the way, big Gary hugs. Oh, that's it. Well, I, I was being yeah. careful. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's your other gift. You can talk a lot and you give great hugs. <laughs> so now you're going to have people just running up to you, hugging you just to test, right? <laughs> no, that's all right. <laughs> uh, yeah. As long as they don't whisper anything in my ear. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. 
Uh, well, thanks to all who are watching or listening. And uh, if you want more information, the links will be provided in the show notes. Um, don't forget to subscribe to North American Egg Spotlight on YouTube and Rumble. Uh, and the podcast is available on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, Amazon, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to today's Egg Spotlight episode where we put the spotlight on people and companies doing great things for the agricultural industry. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Stitcher, or on your favorite podcasting platform and give us a five-star review. You can also follow us on YouTube and Rumble to see the video version of Ag Spotlight. Also, head on over to NorthAmericanAg.com to subscribe to our Industry Connect update newsletter. If you're interested in advertising opportunities, email us at connect at NorthAmericanAg.com. Thanks for listening.